Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. A parking garage in downtown Bloomington is at the center of a debate about the role cars will play in the future of a changing city. So downtown is becoming more dense, more occupied, more businesses, more people living downtown, so they drive less. A historic Indiana town is up for sale, but it won't just go to the highest bidder. Coming up, the story on Story. And Vice President Mike Pence visits an Indiana farm to talk trade. President Trump has done his job. It's time for Congress to do their job and ratify the USMC. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Bloomington residents are curious about the future of transportation as the city's downtown continues to grow and parking is hotly debated. As part of our new city limits project, we answer a question from a viewer who wants to know if the city plans to eliminate cars downtown. Alex Eady has more. Efforts to attract visitors to Bloomington's downtown have sparked contentious debate over how people should get there. But some residents say the city's intentions are unclear. I'm wondering, you know, is it, is it, are they trying to, not trying to, but are they going to make it harder for people like me who live on the west side to get into town and enjoy the benefits and the amenities that they've put down here? Sarah says a 20-minute commute by car is the most viable option for her to get downtown. But she feels cars are becoming less welcome as the area grows. While cars are the most utilized method of getting to and from downtown, the city has shifted its focus in recent years toward more multimodal transportation. But city officials say eliminating cars downtown is not the goal. We certainly want to reduce single occupancy use of vehicles. We want to encourage more multimodal options uh, for people uh, to come to the downtown using different modes. But the task is challenging. The debate about cars downtown has broadened into discussions on climate change, economic development, and upcoming city council elections. The 4th Street garage has become the focus. City officials closed the garage in January after determining it was structurally unsafe. Engineers say the garage has seen deterioration above and beyond what they initially expected. The garage shows significant damage, cracks in the concrete, rusted steel beams, and a number of other structural issues have added nearly $300,000 to the estimated cost of repairs. The council heard from more than 30 residents on the issue Wednesday. Some think the deteriorating garage should be torn down and rebuilt to last several decades. Others believe it should be repaired to last five years to buy the city some time to see how climate change affects the future of transportation. Downtown Bloomington needs more parking. We've needed more parking even when we had the garage. It's ridiculously obvious. We've kicked the can on climate for 30 years. Our backs are literally to the wall now. We are about to drive over a cliff. But in the end, city council members voted to tear down and rebuild the garage, which is part of the city's larger plan to accommodate cars while also pushing for increased use of bikes, scooters, and other ways of getting around. A lot of people are dependent on their automobile, and we'd like to make it an option that they don't have to always depend on that automobile, that they have a very good viable choice for transit or for uh, walking or for biking. Um, and that's something that we're trying to make sure that those options are there. And that's important for residents like Sarah, who hope to see all forms of transportation welcomed in the city's future. Making the access to the downtown equal for everybody. Everybody that 
that wants to drive, people that want to bus in, people that want to bike in. I mean, the city's done a great job with some of those other methods and just keeping options open for everybody. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Alex Eady. We want to hear your questions about the changing face of Bloomington. You can join the conversation by going to WTIU.org slash city limits to ask your questions about the past, present and future of the city of Bloomington. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Lawmakers took steps this week to restrict abortions in the state. They passed bills to limit a procedure known as DNE, which some in the medical community say is the safest procedure for termination of a pregnancy in the second trimester. Legislators also passed a bill that would allow pharmacists to refuse to participate in an abortion procedure for religious, ethical, or moral reasons. Current law only allows doctors and hospital employees to abstain from participating in an abortion procedure. Governor Eric Holcomb quietly signed a bill this week that aims to create hate crimes protections. Many hate crimes measure advocates criticize the bill, though, as inadequate. It excludes specific protections for sex, age, and gender identity. I, too, rise to say shame on you, Governor Holcomb. I can't call it a hate crimes bill, and I think you're deluding yourselves if you call it a hate crimes bill. The new state law, which takes effect in July, allows judges to enact harsher penalties for crimes committed because of bias. The ACLU has raised constitutional concerns over the hate crimes language, arguing it's too vague and overly broad. A bill limiting the regulatory powers of small towns and cities passed out of a House committee this week. The legislation would prevent boards from halting developments within four miles of their city limits. One of the bill's authors says the primary goal is to allow for a more representative and simpler government. That's all, I, that's all I'm trying to accomplish is to make sure that we understand who's, who's got the authority and who doesn't. Debate has centered on wind farms, and wind farm companies argue the four-mile radius limits the amount of land they can develop, while opponents say the so-called extraterritorial powers help mitigate concerns about perceived health risks caused by turbines. Towns could still exercise regulatory powers within a two-mile radius of their limits, but would first need county approval. A state ethics committee has hired an outside attorney to investigate allegations that House Speaker Brian Bosma used campaign funds to collect unflattering information about a former intern who claims she had a sexual encounter with him decades ago. The Indianapolis Star reports an attorney has interviewed the former intern and relatives. Those interviews indicate the ethics panel is taking steps to investigate a complaint that Bosma paid a law firm more than $40,000 in campaign funds to gather information about the woman. A disciplinary panel says Indiana Attorney General Curtis Hill isn't immune from state Supreme Court the state Supreme Court's attorney discipline process just because he's an elected statewide official. The Indiana Supreme Court Disciplinary Commission filed a complaint last month saying Indiana's high court should discipline Hill over allegations he drunkenly groped a lawmaker and three legislative staffers at a bar. Hill opposes the complaint, reaching the investigative stage. The commission's attorney says the case should proceed, arguing that Hill is seeking special and favorable treatment because of his elected post. Police say the teenager who opened fire at a Richmond, Indiana middle school in December was armed with a rifle, a semi-automatic pistol, and materials that could be used to make Molotov cocktails. State police gave an update on the case this week. The boy killed himself during the incident. No one else was injured. Police have said it was the boy's mother who called 911 to warn authorities. Monroe County Commissioner Amanda Barge continues to deny allegations that she sexually harassed a county contractor. She suspended her campaign against Mayor John Hamilton last week after sexual harassment allegations against her surfaced in an Indiana Daily Student report. Now, Barge says she did not sexually harass contractor Brandon Drake and that the article did not tell the complete story. As commissioner, I think it's important to say that I suspended my campaign because I needed time with my family, not because I'm guilty of those allegations. I continue to have compassion for everyone 
that was involved in this story, and that includes Mr. Drake. Drake said he felt like he had no other option than to turn to local media to make his story public in the hopes of holding Barge accountable and sparking change. The Franklin Community School District hopes to find the source of contamination at two of its elementary schools. Tests showed high levels of the cancer-causing chemical TCE and vapor underneath the Needham and Webb, Webb School buildings early last week. But samples inside were at levels the state considered safe. School officials say the district plans to spend about $300,000 to install equipment that will help lower TCE and PCE levels underneath the buildings. Our issue is not cost. Our issue is safety for our kids and ensuring that we are being proactive and innovative. The company that tested the school says it plans to test along a nearby sewer main as well as on the school grounds. Franklin's mayor says the city also hopes to, hopes to have a plan to remediate contamination that the Environmental Protection Agency found along Franklin's sewers soon. A group of evangelicals in Indiana wants the state to expand wind and solar energy. The Evangelical Environmental Network delivered more than 21,000 signatures to Governor Eric Holcomb, demanding 100% renewable energy in the state by 2030. An Indianapolis reverend says Jesus spoke about caring for the less fortunate. The poor are the first to suffer from the lack of clean energy, such as pollution, which then brings on health risks, drinking water quality, breathing issues. They hope Indiana lawmakers will consider actions such as adopting a renewable energy plan or making renewable energy portfolio standards mandatory. The group says clean energy also employs more than four times as many Hoosiers as coal and natural gas. The president's proposed budget cut includes a 15 percent cut to the Department of Agriculture. That could mean cuts to the federal crop insurance program, which most Hoosier farmers rely on. Yeah. U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue says budget decisions are ultimately up to Congress, not the president. I really would wish that we could uh, move forward with a budget and let us know uh, from a financial accountability standpoint uh, what resources we have to deal with. He says Congress must pass a budget or continuing resolution by the end of the federal fiscal year in September. And Indiana University's Lilly Library is getting a boost for its first renovation since it opened about six decades ago. IU President Michael McRobbie announced the Lilly Endowment was providing a $10.9 million grant for renovations. The library opened on the Bloomington cam campus in 1960. It's now home to more than 450,000 rare books that are magnets for scholars all over the world. It's pretty amazing what you can find at that library. It's Joe. one of those hidden gems you walk by and have no clue what's there. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. A Terre Haute museum is moving to a larger space to spread its message of tolerance to a wider audience. And a Martinsville mainstay is celebrating a big anniversary. Ahead, the Candy Kitchen turns 100. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same. And a panel of award winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing. For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Vice President Mike Pence traveled to Indiana Thursday looking to build support for the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade deal. But as Brock Turner reports, the former, gov the former Indiana governor spent most of his time reassuring worried farmers hit hard by trade disputes with China. 
trade is so critical. We're commodity producers here in Indiana. And um, it doesn't matter if you're working on the farm every day or you're in one of the supporting businesses. Our, our livelihoods are, are critically um, connected. Vice President Mike Pence returned to Indiana and visited Lamb Farms in Boone County. He tried to reassure farmers the Trump administration is working for them. But Pence says he can't commit to when such an agreement would be reached with China. At this very hour, uh, the president is actually meeting with the vice premier of China in the Oval Office. Uh, we are making progress on renegotiating our entire trading relationship with China. And I want to promise you it's going to put American agriculture and American workers first. He mentioned a common talking point of a trade imbalance between the two nations, one economists have largely dismissed. The president's imposed a $250 billion in tariffs. To, we really have to end this time of, of, uh, of not only massive trade imbalance, but trade practices that really work against American farmers. Pence did offer a possible lifeline for farmers saddled with declining commodity prices and increasing debt. That is a renegotiated deal. It's called USMCA, and it would replace NAFTA, the existing trade deal between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Pence says President Trump has done his job, and it's time for Congress to do theirs. I want you to know uh, we're with you. The President and I are absolutely determined to see the USMCA completed and ratified by the Congress of the United States this spring. Most farmers say they're on board. They, like Bob Geschwein, say they're still sticking with the Trump-Pence agenda. If I'm out of business, that's too long. But when it gets down to it, we're with the president because he's doing good things here. He's making good, good deals and all. And it's that kind of loyalty that Pence says will help get a deal over the finish line. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. A historic Terre Haute National Bank was facing demolition, but together Indiana Landmarks and the Candles Holocaust Museum sought to meet both of their missions by preserving history from the past and into the future. The museum aims to give visitors more than a lesson in history. That's because Holocaust survivor and Terre Haute resident Eva Kaur founded the museum on a unique message she continues to spread to this day. Forgive and heal. And I always tell people it's probably the most amazing thing. It costs nothing. Everybody can afford it, yet it has such a tremendous effect for good in people's lives. Eva and her sister Miriam were among the thousands of twins who were subjected to disturbing genetic experiments at the Auschwitz concentration camp. Together, Eva and Miriam were among the children who survived. In 1993, Eva conceived the idea for the Candles Holocaust Museum and founded it in honor of her sister who died that year. Candles has grown into a historical community landmark, attracting thousands of visitors from around the world. But the museum has outgrown its space, leaving little room for new exhibits, hosting programs, and for staff to work. But we, we have so little room that we actually have to rent space next door. The museum has its eyes on a new space in a historic building in downtown Terre Haute. The First National Bank on Wabash Avenue has sat vacant for nearly a decade. It looks ordinary from the outside, but it's history, and what's inside might surprise you. Candles is collaborating with Indiana Landmarks, a nonprofit historic preservation agency, to stabilize and repurpose the old building. We work to revitalize communities, reconnect Hoosiers to the heritage, and save meaningful places. Places with deep-rooted history. The original structure was built just after 1900 by the U.S. Trust Company building. A 1927 merger put the building in the hands of the Terre Haute National Bank, which then remodeled it to reflect a new style. The building as you see it today is a result of that 1927-28 remodel. A wonderful, impressive neoclassical bank structure. It still retains such wonderful decorative elements, the wonderful classical features. The amazing three-story banking hall, uh, still, even in a semi-ruinous state, uh, as you've, you've found out, you walk in, you can't help but be immediately impressed. Years later, the Terre Haute Bank moved to a new building next door and became First Financial Bank, and it seemed likely the vacant building would be demolished. The water damage through the roof and then 
through the foundation walls has led to an interior that, as impressive as it is, still in a very deteriorated state. As part of the group's mission, Indiana Landmarks proposed the building as the perfect space for candles, and together the two could create a plan to save the building and its history. So the, the, that imminent demolition threat was alleviated, and then over the past several years we have been working with Candles and First Financial to come to an agreement on donation and long-term use. And that long-term plan has Chambers excited for what the historic building could become. Oh, it's amazing. It's a fantastic space. I cannot wait to begin working with um, designers and architects to figure out how to, yeah, how to uh, make it our own. Indiana Landmarks plans to hold the building and take care of some stabilization work that needs to be done. At the same time, Candles is working to secure funding to rehab the building. Chambers says the museum has a broad network of supporters and foundations they will call on for support. In the meantime, she says they're weighing ideas for how to use the space, including more exhibits, conference rooms, workspaces, and a theater. Though the full process could take years, Kleckner says this collaboration to preserve one of Terre Haute's hidden gems is truly one of a kind. We're thrilled to be able to partner with such a respected organization that's really providing a really important service, uh, that public education. And um, the building itself, just by, by its very presence, helps to tell uh, more the story of Terre Haute and its past. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Alex Eady. Well, you can own an entire Indiana town. The small Brown County community of Story is up for sale. No one really lives there, but it's home to a popular bed and breakfast, restaurant, and event venue. And if the current owner gets his way, this beloved destination isn't going away. When you step into Story, it's like stepping back into time. The town was founded with a, the grant of a land patent from President Miller to Fillmore to Dr. George Story. That was in 1851. Dr. Story built many of the structures still standing today. This small town became a logging and then a farming community. In its heyday, it had two general stores, a church and a school. Then the Great Depression hit. So Brown County lost half its population and this place kind of went to sleep. Luckily, no one attempted to modernize or demolish the buildings. A Bloomington couple bought what now houses the story in in the 80s and acquired more than 20 acres of nearby land. Rick Hofstetter now owns the town. I've been here 20 years. It's time for me to wrap this town into a safety cocoon, put it into safe hands. So Story is up for sale. What we are selling is 17.4 acres. With all the buildings attached to it, more than 20,000 square feet of buildings, all of them historic. While the town and the buildings may be for sale, the business itself is not. So customers who come here for peace and quiet likely won't notice much of a difference. The Story Inn, restaurant, tavern, and event spaces will remain open. The operators will just lease the property from the new owner of the town. And Hofstetter isn't selling to just anyone. This town is zone general business. People can do some stuff with it that I wouldn't necessarily approve. So I, as long as I have breath in my body, we're going to have restrictive covenants to make sure that this place doesn't become a Yogi Bear campground. Not gonna happen on my watch. It won't happen after I'm long since, you know, passed away. Protecting this living time capsule should be a little easier since it recently became part of the National Register of Historic Places. Hofstetter hopes that will ensure its history and charm are preserved for decades to come. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. And Martinsville's historic candy kitchen is celebrating 100 years of sweet success. Pam and I was looking to do a cater house kind of thing, and the buildings we were looking at were gonna take more money than what we had to invest at that time. And someone said that the candy kitchen was closing because they couldn't find any buyers on it. They were trying to sell it. We spent a month with the previous owners, Bob and Karen Boyce, that's who we bought it from. We spent a month with them learning how to make the candies. My grandmother, um, she actually made the majority of the candies. 
um, and I was in here with her working. The granddaughter's 14 and the grandson is 16 and he considers himself part owner of it almost. He can make canes with me and he's learning how to do my part of the cane process so that eventually someone will be helping him make the canes. I think it means a lot to the community. We get a lot of people um, that tell us how much it means to them um, and how grateful they are to us for keeping the tradition alive. Um, I know when mom and dad bought the store, that was the main idea. We didn't want to see it close. When we do the candy canes at Christmas time, we tell the history of the candy kitchen. And for anyone that's been here in the past, they're going to learn a new history because I've learned a lot in the last week. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber Internet Streaming TV Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding expertise results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.com. Edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you.